Abigail, it's great to be with you today. Great to see you. Uh, so my first question is, uh, what has come alive for you in 2020? That's a really good question, right? Because we've been so focused on the things that have uh, ceased to be alive uh, in 2020. But um, I think that uh, there's been an enormous amount of um, awakening that we've witnessed in other people that we felt in ourselves. And for me to have watched uh, the, the national movement around racial equality just absolutely erupt into an undeniable force has been one of the most powerful, humbling, beautiful things I've ever witnessed in my life in this country. And I really think um, that it's not just um, that that's come alive. I think it's come alive in a real way for almost every American. And it feels possible things could really change. What has come alive for you in 2020? Uh, you know, a sense of appreciation for what I have because my life has been turned upside down like a lot of people's lives. Uh, and, you know, my family and I have been fortunate, but this year for me has been so different from last year. Last year, I was away from my family for 75% of the time. Uh, and for the last few years, I've been traveling a lot, not had the opportunity to see my 11-year-old and my 5-year-old very much. And this year I'm here 99% of the time and I'm managing their remote learning and I'm the stay at home dad. It's just a completely different quality of life and perspective. And so what's come alive for me is this you know, um, experience of family. Like I haven't experienced it before as a father. More broadly, in the United States, so many people have had the experience you have, especially men, frankly, who who have often sort of been gone a lot, who've been home, first of all, feeling a little bit more sympathetic about how hard it is to have the dishes done and the laundry done and everybody's education. <laughs> but more importantly, just what the rewards are of being with your kids. For sure. And I think that's something that men have not really had a lot of time to think about until now. And I've been so delighted to watch the joy that's coming out in the men I know who get to spend time with their families. What is the new American dream? That's 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 such an important question, right? Because to, to say that there's a new American dream is to say that perhaps the old one is either outdated or irrelevant or whatever. And, you know, I come from a family that is the very embodiment of the American dream that has, has built a whole, you know, media empire around living the American dream. So I'm very tuned into what that means. The American dream is the, a car, the home. and So that American dream has, has, has left the building. Um, the new American dream, I think, is a version of the old one, except everybody's invited. Because the, the old one that I'm talking about was, of course, available to my uncle, my grandfather, but not to the vast majority of people of color, of, of LGBTQ people, most women, et cetera. Um, the new American dream um, should be seen as a, a dream that we all participate in um, and that w it's not just about the ascent of a single person or a single group of people, but the ascent of, um, of us as a, as a human project. Also, I think that in some ways it's not as materialistic the old American dream was was based on, at least as I understand it, you know, you have the house, have the car, you know, live out for many people live out in the suburbs. Um, and today, um, I hope at least that it's more about finding fulfillment as well, that the American dream is not just tied to material things, although you do need certain things to live and, and to thrive, but it's also tied more to happiness. Yeah, I keep thinking that, um, that that materialism has infected all our conversations um, and that instead of talking about um, feeding and housing and clothing, we should start with dignity. Because actually, if we started with dignity, feeding and clothing and housing would, would come as a natural part of that. That, that is, I think that's a great way to think about it, you know, a baseline of yeah. that we need to afford dignity or not afford that everybody deserves to be treated right. with dignity and, and then go from there. How do you feed everyone? Hmm. 
you know, I'm just finishing this great book by Kurt Anderson called uh, um, Evil Geniuses. <laughs> and toward the very end, he does a really interesting math equation where he takes all of the $19 trillion in income in the United States and all the $100 trillion in wealth and asks the question, if you just took it all and divided it up evenly among the 330 million people in the United States, what would that look like? And everyone would have an income of $140,000 a year and wealth of $800,000 a year. It's a really interesting exercise because what it shows us is that not that we should all divide it up that way and go our merry way, but that there is plenty. There is more than enough. In that scenario, everyone isn't just middle class, they're upper middle class. So we feed everyone, first of all, by caring about everyone enough um, to, to honor the dignity of a human being who has a very different life and isn't close to us physically, but we recognize their full humanity and dignity. And then we, we look at the resources that we have at our disposal and we figure it out. I think really almost everything is possible. What, what about you? What do you think is possible? It strikes me that we're entering this season of change. I think electoral change, um, you know, change based on all of the protests in the street this summer. And what I hope is possible is that we can heal as a country, begin the healing process from what has been a very divided time, a polarized time, a partisanized time, and also uh, find a national sense of purpose, of identity. I think that's that's been one of the hardest things to summon, not just over the last four years, but for many years, is the same kind of sense of national identity and purpose. And, and fundamentally, as you say, a commitment to one another and what we're gonna do together to lift everybody up. Can we find that? I think, I believe that it's possible, but of course it takes good leadership and it takes buy-in from, you know, all of us as citizens. Uh, and, you know, the question is gonna be, are we committed to it? I think it is possible. I think that leadership like yours, frankly, Julian, I just wanna say it, it would be, is key to, to moving us forward in that way. I really do think of you as one of the best voices out there. And I really, um, I think it's possible maybe to have a, 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 a moment with each other after this election where maybe, hopefully, God please, we've bottomed out and uh, we, can, we can start checking back in with each other and building relationships. That would be wonderful. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm nothing if not an idealist <laughs> in the family tradition. 